Hey, JC. Hey, Tom. Mixing up a little bit today. That was weird. Oh, yeah. Want... I mean, oh. I, after after ninety three or however many episodes that we're at, I figure maybe once in a while I I can start the cold open. Yeah, that's that's fine. I just wasn't expecting it. I'm change verse. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, change is good sometimes. Yeah. I Don't like, fear. I like it change. in my pocket. I like it in my piggy bank. You like change that that the actual coins that. I mean, I went to Canada a couple months ago, and they deal a lot more with change there because you have like a dollar coin and two dollar coins and nickels and dimes and all their respective. And they all got the queen on them or something. Yeah, well, their money, the the paper bills aren't like paper. It's almost like plastic, and it's it's different colors, and it's it's better to be quite frank That's... because our money is kind of boring. Well, Frank is France, though. No, they they still do euros. Oh right, <laughs> right. I honestly forgot that was a thing in that moment. I was trying to make a joke, and I forgot the euro existed. Yeah, for now at least, yeah. because I don't know Brexit or something. <laughs> Bre- Brexit and France is like, yeah, I'm out too. France goes. Welcome to. You know what? That reminds me, Britain is all out of the EU. Oh, 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 that's what we call What a segui there. A big segui load to start the show. That, that's this unpleasant. week. That was a callback. That's a throwback. No, the, no it, it's a callback. It's a segui, but it just, yeah. Yeah. Just, just keep going. It's anyway, fine. This week, we're talking about All Out. Yeah. Because that's happening Saturday night. Uh, also Saturday. This is one of those Saturdays, folks. Royal Quest, the first ever NJPW produced uh, event in the UK. And uh, NXT UK, also Saturday, TakeOver Cardiff. All that happening. And we're going to talk about it. Isn't that right, Tom? Yeah, I guess so. I thought you were going into, we're going to talk about it on the Cheers and the Repentant podcast or... We're gonna talk about it today. So, you well, know. you were so gung ho to start the show that I was like, "Let me make sure Tom's got something to well, say." Now, then you started around. Oh, I'm supposed to finish the sentences. We're not in that kind of relationship, Jason. <laughs> not yet. Anyway, Tom, go ahead and ring the bell. Let's do this. Will do. You're listening to the Cheaters Never Pin Podcast, a proud part of the Section 328 Network, bringing you all the best in wrestling from WWE, New Japan, and beyond. Now, live from ringside, it's Mr. Workrate and JC. Oh, buddy. Mom. It's the Cheaters Never Pin Podcast. My name is JC. Here next to me at the commentary table to the stars is my good buddy, Mr. Workrate, Tom. Great to be here as always, JC. Isn't it? It is. <laughs> I love how that's now tagged on to the entire open. It's me going, isn't it? <laughs> it just occurred to me I do that every week. <laughs> Here on the longest running wrestling podcast in the Triangle? Yeah, I would assume so. Well, I the only reason I mentioned that is um, we can say, I guess, since I don't see it on the list anymore, uh, goodbye to one of our competing uh, wrestling triangle broadcasts, one that had big media behind it. Oh. Um, David the, will always be what, Goliath. The, what is it? I believe it was the Get in the Ring podcast that uh, WRAL had uh, slash 99.9 The Fan. Um, they had their own uh, wrestling theme podcast uh, with Chris Morris and... Uh, the other guy who I can never remember who's not actually like an employee at the station, but he does stuff. Anyway, um, Chris Morris, I think left, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, capital broadcasting for another opportunity. I don't know where exactly, but I remember seeing that on Twitter. And then there was mentioned somewhere, uh, just recently I looked up, um, uh, the podcasts that, that run through CBC and there's like, cause there's like a dozen of them only nine or 10 are hosted by Joe Obia. But, <laughs> um, 
of the two or three that are not, um, none of them are wrestling podcasts. So, oh. I hear, so there's an opening. I'm not. I'm yeah, not, I'm not joining big media. Uh, I am. I'm ready to sell out as soon as possible. Oh, no. So I'm all out of that. So Joe, buddy, ringy dingy. Yeah, but seriously, we'll take that. <laughs> Hook a brother up. I'd I'd love to have a microphone that I don't have to balance on my bed. <laughs> if you want to make sure Tom has a mic, he doesn't have to balance on his bed. You can go to Patreon.com. Actually, go to TeetersNeverPin.com. Click the Patreon button and donate. Just, just, just <laughs> find me at a youth hockey event and just yeah. give me cash. Right. Oh, all right, let's dive right in here. Busy weekend, so busy night for us. We'll start with we'll start with the main event. All out from somewhere outside of Chicago, something estates. What is it? Hoffman Estates. Hoffman Estates. That's it. Illinois, the Sears Center, returning to where all this whole weird AEW journey began last Labor Day with All In. So, do you think that's going to be a thing consistently each year? I think they're going to kind of make this their WrestleMania, right? Right. Well, I figured that, but I mean, WrestleMania changed venues every year, so I wasn't sure if Shit. they're going to stay just the same way that like kind of ECW had their own home arena, so to speak. I could see them staying with AEW being the niche product that it is and Chicago being such a wrestling town. I can see that being the case. I mean, and... Not to divert from this too much, but do you think that if Vince wasn't so insistent on, uh, for lack of a better term, world domination at that point with the growth of uh, WrestleMania, do you think that he would have kept the WrestleMania card at Madison Square Garden since it was so, like MSG was so important to titan sports slash wwf at that time that maybe he'd keep his number one card there and then have other well you didn't really have that many super cards at the time you didn't you, wrestlemania was its own thing just the same way starcade was a regular event mm -hmm. in greensboro right you know i'm tempted to say no simply because if i think if that was the case Mania 2 would have stayed there. But you had... The thing with Mania 2 was... Vince had it... Had a WrestleMania... Had WrestleMania 2 in every area. Like, the Midwest got a WrestleMania. Yeah. The East Coast got their WrestleMania. And the West Coast got their WrestleMania. Right, but I think that's kind of the hint that like this is bigger, this is bigger than Madison Square Garden. Right, but that's what I mean. It's like it's been showing, hey, we're not a region because at the time WrestleMania one happens, and we're completely diverting from the tech, the topic here. But when WrestleMania one happens, for the most part, WWF is still the a regional promotion. Yeah. Yeah, By the time WrestleMania 2 happens, Vince is getting into the territories. He's invading territories. He's already gotten stars from a lot of these territories. So now he's daring to go into Chicago, which, I mean, didn't yeah. necessarily have too much of a territory, so to speak. But, I mean, he goes into Chicago. He goes into L.A., which had their, you know, regional stuff, but didn't have, like, the stronghold that Crockett had in the the southeast, mm -hmm. or that uh, uh, Fritz von Erich had in Texas, that type of thing. I, I, yeah, I think I think you can actually look at Mania as kind of the kickoff of the national expansion, right? Because without Vince planning Mania, I don't think Vince pulls the trigger on the Rock and Wrestling connection to get Mania over at such a national level. So I think almost, you know, that's saying, you know, this is our home. You know, MSG is WWE's home. So we're going to we're going to start this journey here. Right. And then and then it's that's it. You know. And then we go from there. 
because you figure That's... you have near you have New York City. You're selling to a crowd that, I mean, for the most part, MSG. They were doing shows at MSG to begin with every month or two or whatever it was, and you know they they were packing those shows pretty well. Maybe not necessarily a sellout, but those shows did well, and those were you know house shows. They were they were better than normal house shows, but they were still house shows. Right. So you're going straight into the heart of your market and you're going, hey, all we have to do is sell, you know, potentially 3,000 more tickets. Or, and we're putting a lot bigger stars showcased on this thing. Yeah. I, I think if you're looking at it that way, I think so given that that's when the national expansion wants to begin, right? That's when he's making the push to begin it. Of course, it, it's logical and it makes sense to do it at MSG because that way now an entire national audience watching this on closed circuit is seeing a packed house in in your neck of the woods so it gives it gives the the visual appearance that of how important it is because it's sold out and MSG had production facilities they I mean, they were still running the when they would do those cards, they would show those on MSG Network. So you had production facilities, you know, you you had stuff already in place. You didn't worry about having to try to, you know, put bring the trailers in and try to, you know, put together a show at, you know, some other arena. Right. You knew that you you pretty much had your sight lines and everything like that in place for MSG. So yeah. that and MSG being the world's most famous arena. Yes. Like it gives that gravitas to the event. Yeah. So it sets it sets the stage. Yeah. Interesting. So I've never really thought about that before. But yeah. So So that was probably a discussion we should have saved for last week. Yeah. (laughs) Rather than 25 minutes on Vince McMahon's Brazilian steakhouse. Yes. (laughs) Which has made me laugh all week, by the way, every time I think (laughs) about it. Um, But yeah, so contrast to Madison Square Garden, the Sears Center in Hoffman Estates, Illinois. (laughs) Uh, But but that transition, maybe that will be AEW's... Madison Square Garden yeah. in the sense that they don't need necessarily to go jump into a facility that's a giant facility that you know just kind of like shows off and goes this is who we are you know like when New Japan had their first big card so to speak in America it ended up in Dallas which was, you know, <laughs> questionable to begin with. Free building. Yeah, free building. You know, from a financial standpoint, it was fine. But from a view standpoint, it was questionable. Yeah. You because know, it did not look impressive. So yeah. you're like, oh, who is this? You know, this well, rinky dink. We got to look at it too. Sears Center, I believe, is the biggest building they're running. Right? So that's their, you know, that's... That's that's their stadium right now. Whereas you look at, you know, all of their TV tapings are in smaller coliseums and college basketball venues, which are several thousand seats smaller. So even if even if all out, whatever this Labor Day weekend show evolves into over the years, um, I, I don't see it reaching a stadium level. And, and, right. and then maybe that's really poor foresight on my part. Right. I still think. I still think AEW will have national appeal, but I still think it's I still think it's a niche product. Yeah, and 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 that's what they, I think that's what they want to be, and they're okay with that. But I see them maybe you know they can go to a Staples or an MSG for this event as their big one. Right. I mean, like you go back to ECW. ECW knew that they were a niche product. They didn't. I mean, initially at least, and they knew that one of their big things was that their crowd was going to be responsive too. So you wanted that hot crowd so that when you were watching the product, you had that hot crowd around it. So it was just like, Oh, you know, this is probably a cool show to go to. So even, you know, when they were doing these pay-per-views and uh, you know, the bigger shows or whatever, I mean, they did ECW arena at first because, well, that's, 
you know, that was their home. But when they would do these pay-per-views, they would do smaller venues still kind of on the, you know, East coast type thing. But I mean, they, I mean, I went to a pay-per-view in Asbury park, New Jersey, you know, that was like, 2,000, 2,500 people or whatever, but, you know, it was a tight crowd that, yeah. you know, they got into it. It looked good on TV. People weren't that far away. You saw what, you know, was a packed house, basically. And the crowd was responsive and they got into it. So it, it's, when you're catering to something like pay-per-view, you don't need a huge house. I mean, mm-hmm. it's 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 nice, but you want something that's going to look good on TV. You want a crowd that's going to sound good. And that, I mean, that's what you're selling is just something that isn't echoing like the building's half empty or that people are disinterested, that type of thing. So to that end, what really worries me is their first live TV date. At Capital One Arena in DC, so it was a sellout. There are there are no first party tickets left. But conversely, if you look on any ticket reseller, the the market has completely bottomed out because the scalpers got in there so fast. There are hundreds upon hundreds upon probably thousands of tickets available in Capital One Arena for eight bucks, and yeah. they're still sitting there. That worries me for their first TV outing. Now, Boston and Philly have sold out and are, are actually commanding much higher prices on resale. But I don't, is that uh, makes me nervous for their first TV outing. Yeah. And you can't pay I for the house no, now. Those no. tickets are sold. Yeah, that's that's the problem. That it's You've kind of stepped in that. So... I mean, I don't know how they're going to necessarily get around that. Uh, I mean, if they're expecting maybe that, I mean, for those tickets are going to be at $8 or whatever, that yeah. people will, you know, eventually kind of buy those tickets night of that type of thing and, you know, yeah. get what would essentially be a decent walk up. But um, third party. Yeah. It just worries me that that. There's such there is such a demand um, in these other cities, and it doesn't appear to be that in DC. Because you would think, if this perceived demand that we're led to believe that they have right now is there, that these eight dollar tickets are still just wallowing there, it makes me nervous for them. Well, it's weird because you you have what's basically the opposite problem that of the New Japan shows that they first introduced in. Charlotte and uh, a couple other locations uh, when they first did the New Japan kind of tour without the Japanese wrestlers. Um, (laughs) But those tickets went immediately because one, they were doing small venues like 2,000 to 2,500 seats. But also they didn't release all the tickets all at once and which pissed off a lot of people, especially for the fact that they didn't actually they they started selling tickets earlier than they announced they were going to so tickets ended up getting sold out before people who believed that the tickets were going to go on sale on that particular date actually got online <laughs> uh, which caused you know a whole bunch of people to be pissed off and then you know, they they let it simmer for like two weeks and then it was just like, Oh look, we found more tickets because that's what you know, promotions do. They right. and New Japan was playing it you know, was playing it extremely safe because they wanted to sell, you know they they didn't want to run into the issue, I mean, basically that AEW's running into right now is either good seats still available or holy crap the building's know, empty <laughs> yeah half the building's <laughs> empty because scalpers got it or whatever so it's like all right let's dip our foot into the water and see what the demand is oh demand was really good and there's still a lot of people still looking for tickets and you know they're starting to hit the secondary market and prices are okay we can open up some more tickets now yeah i mean i'm looking so i'm looking at StubHub right now for October 2nd. The the floor seems okay. Like 
there's pockets of tickets near the ramps are near either side of the ramp is pretty bad right now there's 42 on one side and 82 on the other starting at 180 bucks um for the lower bowl is got pretty big pockets upstairs not too bad <laughs> but it's it's a big that's a big facility i mean that's that's an nba nhl arena right like i don't know if that was the wisest place to start but we'll see i mean there's a lot of time between now and october 2nd and i understand wanting to do that arena because yeah i mean it's it's symbolic it's a lot you know there was believed to be a lot of demand for that like oh come to our first you know like the first nitro the first well not the first raw necessarily because people didn't know what the hell was going on but right. you know the these type of events it's like oh well, and aw does have a dedicated fan base so mm-hmm. like if you're gonna have that initial beginning show that you know is gonna be one of those things to knock it out of the park then i'm yeah yeah i just i don't know it, it worries me we'll see there's a lot of time left but, but all, i mean all out certainly sold out yeah <laughs> So let's let's run down the card. First off, if you don't know what's happening at All Out, uh, AEW has announced uh, Friday night at 10 o'clock on TNT, they are airing a one-hour special, Countdown to All Out, which I'm assuming is probably just the Road to All Out episodes recut into a TV show. <laughs> probably. I don't know. We'll find yeah. out. Maybe a little introduction to characters, that type of thing. Yeah. Um. So, starting at 7 o'clock on the YouTubes, is the buy-in. They gotta stop with that name. It doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, there are two matches on the pre-show. There's a tag match, Private Party, take on Angelico and Jack Evans. Cool. Great. And then the 21-woman casino battle royale. This is still the dumbest gimmick in professional wrestling, right? They're trying something different, and, you know... Maybe it'll work better this time. Yeah. Right? I mean, it can't go worse. We have some notes. <laughs> Let's try it again. Maybe everyone comes out at the right time this time. Yeah. We'll find out. Um. So, so far, announced for this Battle Royal, which is in two days from when we record, and we don't have 21 women listed. <laughs> um, Awesome Kong, Brandy, Allie, Yuka Sakazaki... Nyla Rose, Britt Baker, Teal Piper, daughter of Roddy Piper, making her wrestling debut. Uh, Jazz, Ivelisse, Big Swole, uh, wife of Cedric Alexander, and Sadie Gibb. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. And the winner of this will receive a match for the inaugural AEW Women's World Championship on October 2nd. So. Who knows? We'll see what happens. All right, main card, eight o'clock. I just, I, I just had to look up how old Jazz was because it seems like she's been wrestling forever. Ever. Yeah, forty-six. Yes, so she has. <laughs> but lot, not as career. old. I mean, and no offense to her or anything like that. Not as old as I thought she was, just because it seems like she's been wrestling for such a long time. Yeah, this is somebody who was wrestling during you know during the Attitude Era. Right. Yeah. Um, main card available on Bleach Report Live here in the US. Fight everywhere else. I think it's sixty dollars. Here you go. Uh six man tag match. Luchasaurus, Jungle Boy, and Marco Stunt take on SCU. That'll be fun. Luchasaurus, Jungle Boy, and Marco Stunt may be the most over faction gimmick, whatever you want to call it, in professional wrestling right now. Yeah. And it's so enjoyable, it's fun. It's two tiny humans and a giant beast man. <laughs> and he just throws them at people. It's amazing. Uh, Ryo takes on uh, Hikaru Shida in a singles match. Yep. If, if you're here for the Joshi, enjoy. Um, <laughs> then <laughs> in the Cracker Barrel Clash, <laughs> which reading Cracker Barrel's press release on this yesterday had me rolling. Because <laughs> this is an officially sponsored match by Cracker Barrel. 
Darby Allen versus Joey Janela versus Jimmy Havoc. Now, the main debate that I saw online was, who's ending up in a Cracker Barrel <laughs> and being thrown? Yeah. Uh, Darby Allen is the correct answer. Um, somebody is getting some body part trapped underneath a rocking chair. Oh, my God, yes. I didn't even think about using a rocking chair. <laughs> um, someone is getting slapped in the face with giant checkers pieces. Yeah. Absolutely. There's got to be a giant checker spot in there somewhere. Uh, yeah. Or you go through the giant checker board, obviously. There we go. Uh, and actually, they take off the mat, and they take off the canvas off of the ring, and the, the plywood underneath is actually like the cracker barrel, like signature like gray wood. <laughs> and that's what they're wrestling on. Um, which wrestler is getting uh, tees jammed into their head from the little trunk? Angle jump the tease thing. <laughs> uh, it's Jimmy Havoc shoving him in the joint. Janelle said, Done. "Yeah, okay, easy. Yeah, that's, that's an easy." I call. figured that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, that's the whole match. It's just seeing which one of them gets the lowest score in that game. <laughs> and we're going to have three older people at ringside just waiting and kind of like browsing around old candy and things like <laughs> that, waiting for the match to end so that they can then be seated in the ring. Yes. I was going to say the entire ramp is actually like a, the Cracker Barrel store part. <laughs> the entire ramp. <laughs> just like quilts. Mid and... Midway through the match, a bus shows up. <laughs> God, I want Cracker Barrel though. This is good marketing. Yeah. Uh, Cody takes on Sean Spears with his uh, manager, Tully Blanchard. I, l I love the idea of Tully Blanchard being involved in this angle. And Tully cutting consistent promos about, you know, Sean reached out to me because he knows I know the Rhodes family. He knows I know how to deal with them. I'm like, it's perfect. It's good. Re it's good. Like, it's good wrestling history throwback for a young promotion to do. Yeah. Because that's the thing. It's like you're appeal you're appealing to younger fans with, you know, this kind of alternative base and things like that. But, you know, give a nod to old school because you don't necessarily have that in WWE either. Like WWE is losing the young audience, but there's also a, you know, kind of a throwback audience that knows Tully and Arn and the four horsemen feuding with Dusty and mm -hmm. Magnum and that whole thing. Yeah. Well, I think, too, I think that's here to give most AEW fans credit. They're students of the game. Yeah. In general. Like, they're younger, but they're, they know the history of the sport. Uh, the Lucha Brothers, Pentagon and Ray Phoenix, take on the Young Bucks for the AAA World Champ Tag Team Championships. Is, is this a new match? This is the Escalera. Has this ever happened before? No, you would think. But for the first time ever, it's the Escalera de la Muerte match. So it's a ladder match. The Escalator of Death. So Matt sells his back for 20 minutes. Yes. <laughs> no, this will be really good. If there's, if there's four guys right now you want on ladders in professional wrestling, that's these four. So there'll be no escalators involved? There are no escalators. Oh. Actually, I mean, it is. It's just temporarily stairs. Because the escalator is the deadliest thing in the mall. <laughs> Remember that episode of Rescue 911? Where the kid, like, was sitting on it? One, I just I just called back Rescue 911. Let's go there. But No, I, I, I just thought that was a mall rats gimmick. That kid oh, yeah. is on the escalator I again. About, I haven't watched mall rats in forever. But, yep, <laughs> I need to. Yes, uh, like in the back of Volkswagen. <laughs> uh, a tag team match where the winners will receive a first round bye in the AEW World Tag Team Championship Tournament. The best friends, Chuck Taylor and Trent Bretta, take on the Dark Order. Yep. I'm yep, really done with the Dark Order already. <laughs> it's just dumb. Uh, here's here's to Chucky e. T and Trent. Uh, let's yeah. see. Uh, then your top two matches: 
Kenny Omega versus Pac, because I believe after after we recorded last week, Moxley uh, did confirm he will be out of All Out. Uh, yep. Due to a severe MRSA infection in his elbow. I'm assuming it's the same elbow he had issues with when he had surgery when he was in WWE and had to fight it off, right? Is it? Uh, not for nothing, but God, I hope so. I mean, that would be better, question mark? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he's he's he is out for a while. Uh, so stepping up to the plate is Pac. So Pac finally getting his AEW debut. Cool. Which we weren't sure was going to happen or not because of Dragon Gate and whatever was yeah the drama that was involved there. But Pac dropped his Dragon Gate title, so so yeah. Now I guess we don't he... have to worry about that anymore. Yes, but now you can tee him up right. Uh, if you kind of look at this, it's essentially a number one contenders match, right? Which I think is what it was before with Moxley and Omega, right? It was going to be the number one contenders match uh, to set up the first title feud kind of going into TV. I mean, yeah, that's essentially what it is. Because you have the next match that you're going to talk about. But in regards to the rest of the roster, I mean, Kenny Omega and Moxley were the two top wrestlers that weren't involved with it that, you know, also didn't technically, like, own the company. Uh, They're and, arguably the top two names in the company, right? Yeah. I mean, overall. I mean, I mean Cody's there, too, but, I mean, Cody has himself kind of taken a kind of step back. Like, he's almost... I mean, I kind of hate to say it, but he's almost in kind of the Tommy Dreamer type role in ECW where I, you know, I'll be involved. I know I'm a marketing thing, but I don't have to be involved with the title. Mm-hmm. I don't have to be on top. Right. Yeah. But I I will be symbolic of the company, but you don't have to build around me. You're right. This match will be good, though. Yeah, it's gonna be it's it'll it'll be crazy. And I heard uh, I've I've seen people online kind of complaining, you know, saying, "Well, yeah, what's the story behind it?" And well, it's difficult to build stories behind a lot of these things, especially one because you know y- y- this match is happening because of an injury. Yeah, and we're we're bringing in a person who wasn't really available up until recently. So, no, there isn't. The story is Pac is back and he wanted to be involved before and Mm -hmm. now he's here and he's gooder than other people. Pac is shooting for the big gun in his first outing. That's it. That's the story. That's all you need. Yeah. Um, Then the main event crowning the first ever AEW world champion. They'll have to wear the largest belt, I believe, ever created. <laughs> uh, Adam Page, the hangman, takes on Chris Jericho. <sighs> this match. I have really mixed feelings about this match. Like, I don't... Like, Jericho winning's cool, and it's it's good for the brand, right? I also don't... Jericho doesn't need the belt. He's old. And I mean that in the nicest humanly possible way. Can he carry a company as the top worker holding a belt? At, at this day and age? No. Is Adam Page ready to be a world champion? No. Right. That's my other thing. Like, I mean, pa- Page has certainly, I would say, in the last two years, right? He's come leaps and bounds. Yeah. And, uh, of course, with him being a native of Greensboro, I'm pulling for him, right? Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull for the North Carolina boy. But I just, I don't know. I just, I, as soon as we knew this was the the feud for the first title, I had just kind of inherent issues with it for just because I'm like, okay, but it sucks because I I think they really could have built up page in the long run. Page is a guy you have that do that long chase. Yeah. 
And you give him that entire first year of TV where he keeps getting close and he keeps getting close and he almost does it and he almost becomes number one contender and then he finally does and he loses and he, you know, and then finally he captures gold. I'm not saying it has to be the extreme Daniel Bryan version of this, right? Right. But you give him that trajectory of where he's always almost good enough. And he never is. And I, I think it's one of those things of, it's him losing. It's not Adam Page getting screwed out of opportunity. It's not Adam Page uh, getting screwed in a title match. I think it's just he's always almost good enough. Right. I think that's the way you build him a little more successfully. Now, I think this is, okay, this is going to be a good match. Like, I'm not, you know, I don't want to, sh- I don't want to crap all over it. And I think, uh, there again, I think it, for all the negatives I've just laid upon either option here, I think either one of the winning is also a very good thing for the brand. You know, Adam Page winning, it's, it's one of the elite guys. It's fan service. It's, and it's a strong way to start the brand. And when Adam Page comes out, on TNT on October 2nd, holding that belt for the first time, he is instantly the most credible person in the promotion to a fan turning it on for the first time. So he's made overnight. Right. Or is Jericho. Now he's holding the belt. He's, you know, one of the greatest of all time. It, And then you see, all right, well, he's on the top of the mountain. Then you create, then you have the ability to create stories off of that. And maybe even that's when the page chase really begins. I don't know. But I I don't know that this was the right decision to make at this time. And I don't know. It, it the thing is too if if they do put the belt on page in the you know in this match, I think a lot comes down to Jim Ross because Jim Good Ross point. calling this match can make Adam Page a superstar. Yeah, he could have his. The Austin era has begun moment, right? Yeah. I mean, and and I don't know. I mean, I haven't listened to enough Jim Ross calling AEW to know what Jim Ross this is. If it's, you know, Attitude Era Jim Ross where he could do that stuff on a regular basis. You know, 80s Era Jim Ross. That whole, you know, 15 year kind of like sweet spot of his or if it's yeah i mean you know he's an older guy it's it's i don't want to say time has passed but i mean like it's uh, it's not new japan jim ross where he didn't know what the hell was going on I, but I, can he be the star maker that he was in the late 90s yes i I fully base that on his commentary and his call when Moxley debuted at Double or Nothing. His, his, everything he said during that, his, what the hell, it's, it's Moxley, the whole screaming, that whole presence of JR making that moment happen around what was going on was good old JR. He still has it in him. Okay. And he, yeah, so I uh, yeah he's he's capable of it for sure. Well, that I have no doubt. And then uh, since we are talking about commentary, we can talk about the rest of the booth. It was announced this week that Tony Schiavone is all elite. That'll put asses in the seats, <laughs> right? How great is that? Jr. and Tony Schiavone together. Dogs and cats. Well, right? it's fun. I mean, well, they. I mean, it, it's basically a late '80s WCW show. <laughs> yeah, true. I think it's. I think. Well, I, okay. I still hate the three man booth overall. Right. I still think it's just too many voices. But the construction of this one is so interesting because you've got Excalibur, who intimately knows the history of a lot of these guys and is able to speak to moves and things at a very high level. You've got JR who can provide the emotion that it needs, right? And the color really. And then you've got Shivani who has been, he's been calling MLW, right? So he's got, he, you know, Shivani, I, I still think you're play by play guy, right? He's the primary voice in the booth. 
you've got JR adding adding the story pieces and you've got Excalibur adding the technical pieces. Well, has it been officially confirmed that Shivani's actually on the I know yes. he's part of the broadcast team, but is he going to be doing Yes, it was that was confirmed. Okay. Mar- Alex Marvez is thankfully being put out of his misery. Right. No, I understand, um, but I mean like Yeah. I mean there will be times I think, you know, Shivani's still calling Georgia football and the Falcons too, I believe, right? So, you know, there will probably be times where he's he's not there and then you can put Marvez in. But yeah, there's Golden Boy too, right? Well, I wasn't sure if you were going to have like, you know, you, you've you got. I'm going to look this up while you talk. Okay. I wasn't sure if they were going to have, say, like the two man booth and then you have Tony backstage and, you know, that type of thing where you have somebody can, you know, like doing all the interviews and things like that, you know, in the ring while you have. Again, you're two people uh, doing the commentary the entire time. I I had seen that he was part of the broadcast team. I didn't hear necessarily that he was part of the commentary team. So AEW's press release, maybe this is TNT's press release. I don't know. So he's not. He, I, I, my assumption is he's not there on Saturday. Based on that, he probably is because I think he is at Starcast. But I, you know, anyway. Uh, The press release says, and I quote, Shivani, widely considered to be one of the most important voices in professional wrestling, joins AEW's television broadcast team of Jim Ross and Excalibur. So he's at the table. That's his broadcast team doesn't say commentary. I mean, I would assume when you phrase it that way, it's commentary, right? I don't know. Okay, well, here's here's Satin. Now I'm getting more into this. Here's Ryan Satin from Pro Wrestling Sheet Stating. Uh... Shivani's announcement is worded to sound like it makes like Tony is joining the commentary team. I'm told that's not the case. He'll just be on the overall broadcast team in addition to his role as a senior producer. Yeah, because I, I mean, I couldn't imagine the two of them together at the same time. I, I just, I just picture bumping heads basically. So okay, so. All right, so maybe that means your your actual commentary team is Golden Boy, Jr. and Excalibur, and then you've got the eighteen hundred apparently people AEW has doing backstage stuff. <laughs> they have more than WWE doing backstage, don't they? Wait, you mean like road agents or no doing broadcast? I mean, yeah. Shivani is a is a producer. Right. I'm sure he's not producing the actual wrestling piece of it. He may be producing commentary and <laughs> they just have him producing Marvez doing his by the numbers, which by the way, anytime Alex Marvez does one of his by the numbers things, it's freaking great. He's amazing at that. Use him as your stats guy. It's awesome. But anyway, that's all out Saturday yeah. night. Uh, of course, uh, we touched on the star cast is happening all weekend uh the only thing of note looking at it in my opinion there's it's all the podcasts that are being recorded and this and that and the other the biggest thing you're going to see about and hear about no matter what gets said or what happens during it saturday at noon is cm punk so be prepared starting at 12 o'clock on saturday to see nothing but cm punk talk yeah i mean I don't know. It just I'm interested to see what comes out of it. I think but he's gotten I way smarter. No... Yeah. Especially given the whole art of wrestling disaster. Right. So I think people the... are expecting that level of thing. It's not that's not going to happen. And the rumors of Punk's agent Speaking to FS1. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Who knows about that? Yeah, there is a room for those of you that haven't caught it. There is a rumor that was floated this week that CM Punk's agent has been in contact with FS1, who is producing a weekly WWE kind of news show. Uh, of 
course, that would be Fox's hiring decision and not WWE's. So, I have a feeling, though, WWE would be able, would be able to be like, I oh, know. <laughs> right? Yeah, I... I feel like if you're Fox, you're not you're not trying to hamper that relationship in, before it even begins. I'm curious if I mean, well, Fox is paying the money, so yeah. But if you're Fox, you're not going to hire some guy who you know is more than likely going to go on TV and violently vomit upon all of one one of your major content producers. And something you've because, now invested millions upon hundreds of millions of dollars in. Because if there's one thing that Fox Media does not like, it's controversy and attention brought to its commentators. <sighs> That's true. Yeah. That, did, that, that did just happen this week, didn't it? Yeah. Doug Gottlieb did just open his fat, stupid mouth this week. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Um, boy, whew. Oh, conversation ran long, so let's let's plow through the rest of this here. Yeah. Uh, also on Saturday, Royal Quest from NJPW in the UK. Uh, there's a bunch of matches. I guess the uh, main match, top top of the card, Okada versus Suzuki for the IWGP Heavyweight Championship. Yeah, we're we're not getting a title change or anything. No. Uh, Zack Saber Jr. defends the British heavyweight open the British heavyweight championship against uh, Tanahashi. Maybe a title change there. I don't know. We'll see. That is, of course, the British heavyweight championship being the premier title of Rev Pro. Yeah, um, that, I I don't see anything happening there, but yeah, it and could. Then, and then uh. Possibly here, Ishii defends the never open weight championship against Kenta. That's going to be a fun match. Yeah, that's going to be a stiff as hell. Oh yeah, I just want to see Kenta sit on top of Ishii. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I have a feeling Kenta's taking that title, and again, like you said, ch- uh, throwing a little disrespect. Um, Shibata's way. Yeah. Shibata, who uh, in JPW did something very interesting with his bio this week. Did you catch this? No. Um, so apparently they, they updated his bio. They've since deleted this off. They're like, will he return to the ring to defend his honor? Whatever. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. To defend his honor? Or will he help find someone in the dojo who will stand up to Kinta and the Bullet Club? And I'm like, you're really floating the idea that he's cleared. Can you not do that? One, don't clear him. Period. Two, don't put that out there. They promptly got rid of it. So either A, he's cleared and they're trying to keep it quiet, which I think is an awful idea. Or B, uh, somebody just got a little too creative. (laughs) Doctors are doctors. I know, and NJPW is such a different world than WWE, right? I mean, and we were saying the same thing about Daniel Bryan however many years ago. Yeah. I mean, and there's been, I mean, God, it's been, what, two years now? Yeah, but my thing with Bryan, right, like, he's able to find this alternative hyperbaric treatment to treat these lesions. He, you know... He's got scan upon scan upon scan. Not that I'm not saying Shibata doesn't have this, right? Or that there's a lesser standard of medical care in Japan. I'm not saying that. But I feel like the NJPW mindset about how you protect someone who may be able to be injured more easily is a lot different than that in WWE. Because, of course, you know... This is all conjecture, but in WWE, apparently, Brian takes a bump to the head. He gets he gets impact tested after every match, apparently. Right? Like, they're super cautious with him. Does, in, does New Japan do that with, with Shibata? I mean, you're also running into different injuries, too. You're running into with... And the concern with Brian is the concussions. 
and pretty much his quality of life. Whereas Shibata's a brain Shib- bleed. Shib- Shibata is, will he die? I think that's worse. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, and that that's kind of the thing. It's like, well, you know, Brian's kind of basically signed off on the fact of, well, you know, uh, concussion could potentially happen or whatever. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I take responsibility for, I have, you know, a lesser quality of life further on down the line. Shibata's basically, you know, where do you sign off on that? Well, I know I could probably die. So, oh, well. Yeah. And I think, but I think in, in WWE too, you, you've like, if Brian needed to adjust his style and he has a little bit right to kind of soften things up and make it easier for him, it's okay. I think if Shibata comes out with a different kind of softer style, then he's not going to be received well anymore because of the nature of that promotion, right? Right. And I th- I think he should if he comes back, which, again, he should not. Uh, I, I, just, I think it ruins the character, right? If he comes back and he's like, now I'm doing bear hugs because I'm... Shibata with the brain bleed. Right. Or is wearing a rugby helmet. <laughs> uh, so that is at uh, 1 o'clock Eastern here in the U.S. At 2 o'clock Eastern, live and exclusive on the WWE Network, is NXT TakeOver Cardiff, NXT TakeOver UK, NXT UK Take... I don't whatever. I don't have to get the phrasing right. I'm not Michael Cole. I don't have Vince yelling in my ear. Uh, the NXT UK Women's Championship is on the line. Tony Storm takes on Kaylee Ray. Walter defends the Men's UK Championship against Tyler Bate. Uh, the Tag Championships are on the line. Zach Gibson and James Drake defend against Mark Andrews and Flash Morgan Webster. And also the team of Gallus, which is uh, Coffee and Wolfgang. Uh, there's a last man standing match between Joe Coffee and Mastiff. Dave Mastiff. That, that's a big hoss fight. I'm excited for that. Uh, and then Travis Banks takes on Noam Dar. Oh, and by the way, Cesaro is going to show up too. <laughs> Which is that's ex- fun. Yeah, that's exciting. That he's like, I'm going to go to NXT UK. Which is fine if they're not using him on the main roster. Use him there. He'll fit in well. He'll fit in perfectly there. Yeah, and at least he's being utilized, right? And who knows? Maybe we introduce. Seamus that way as well. If he comes back. Which may not end up happening, but... I don't know. This is going to seem like a weird comment, especially given what NXT is now. I think Seamus is too big for NXT. Not like physically. But I just feel like he's... Yeah. I feel like that's a weird name to send down. I mean, he is a former world heavyweight champion. Yeah. I mean, not that it couldn't be done. And not that, again, he wouldn't fit in there well there and it'd be cool, right? Like, Seamus versus Walter. Well, I just meant, Put, like... Give me that. I, I'll see. The thing is, too, I don't see NXT UK as NXT. As weird as that kind of interpretation okay. is. Yeah. I can I understand. I understand what you mean though. I mean, he'd be good there to, you know, help get some young talent over. I mean, I think if we if we called that something different, if it wasn't NXT UK, if you had called it you know, WUK or something. Wuck 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 wuck. Yeah. <laughs> If Walter were holding the Wuck Championship. <laughs> God, what a terrible name. <laughs> it's actually the noise that, that, that's made in Pac-Man. Wuck, wuck, wuck. It's Wuck. I want... Think of all the promotion we could do with it. Huh. Wuck you. <laughs> oh, God. Vince is like, it's... <laughs> 
Europe's 20 years behind anyway. It's the Attitude Era there. Get the walk out. Oh, but, right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So that, yeah. All right. That, that that joke line didn't work as well as I thought it would. So no. Nope. All right. So that's Saturday. It's a busy day. Oh boy. And college football starting. So <laughs> pop yourself in front of the television, children. Here we Oscar's go. Still undefeated after like ten years. There you go. I'm just, I'm just glad we play Friday night. So I got time. I got time to watch all this. So Funko, who makes the pop figures, mm-hmm. is coming out with uh, some college mascots. Yeah, okay. kind of the ones that you'd expect, like, yeah, the USC Trojan. The and... Wisconsin Badger is absolutely on there. I just feel like he'd look good as a pop. Yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for Wake Forest. Yeah. I need I need that. I need that Deacon pop. <laughs> Uh, I I need that Deacon Pop because I want you to sign it. Well, that would be weird. Why would I sign it? It would be weird to have a signature that says J.C. Bobbitt on a Demon Deacon. Fine. Screw you then. (laughs) I don't want it now. I mean, I'll sign it. No. Too late. I feel like that devalues it somehow, though. (laughs) You you just devalued it now, so forget it. Never mind. I mean, I know a guy. I could, I mean... I'm good. Nope. For, I'm good friends with the Demon Deacon. I could actually get him to sign it for you. No. No. It's okay. No. Okay. Just... No, I wa- I wanted your signature, but it's too late now. Oh, I mean, I'll gladly sign it. I mean, it's fine. I'll pay. No. I'll pay you to sign it. How about that? No, it's it's too late. I'm going reverse Virgil here. The ship has sailed. Uh, fine, just like it has on this podcast. So, Tom, tell the people where they can find me on the internet. Go on the Twitter machine at Mr. Workrate at MR Workrate. Uh, don't go to the F- Pop Funko site because you know I don't want any more. I want I want I want a pop of you and me. Yeah, I do want that. Actually. That'd be fun. Yeah. Uh, you can find me on the internet at JC Bobbit at J C B O B B I T T wherever finer social media is purveyed. You can find us on Twitter at Cheaters and BR Pin, Facebook, Instagram. We're all over the place. Uh, we're still also. I would still like you to suggest a new name for this podcast. Yeah. Listening. We're still open to suggestions. Absolutely. Uh, Mainly because we're not really good at coming up with that stuff. Yeah. If you, if you could listen to us, try to uh, figure out what the name of this podcast is going to be for 10 minutes after we hit record or stop recording every week. Uh, yeah. So we're not good at the creative part of this. Do our work for us. Yeah. Please. Uh, next week. Well, I won't talk about what happened at All Out. We'll talk about anything major that comes out of Royal Quest or TakeOver Cardiff. Uh, and whatever other crazy mess may happen in the world of professional wrestling. So that's all, yet again, for the Cheaters Never Pin podcast. I'm JC. I'm Tom. And we'll catch you on the flip side.